Thanks everybody for coming to support Charnel with her thesis defense today. So I'm gonna give a little intro to Charnel and then she's gonna talk to us about the really amazing and cool work that she's been doing. Charnel was an undergraduate at CSUMB and that's how I first met her in I think 2016. I looked it up last night, but I can't remember if that's right, but I think it's right. In 2016 when she was a student in my marine ecology class. But as a student at CSUMB, she did a lot more than just be in my marine ecology class. Um, Charnel worked with uh, Dr. Steve Moore's lab as an undergraduate working with uh, One People, One Reef in Ulithi using work to use ROVs to map coral reef habitats, which might seem like, you know, a good fit for some of the work she's going to talk to you about today. Um, so while she was there, she got to be in the field um, and be out and have this experience in a tropical, uh, in tropical ecosystem using ROVs and working with local communities as an undergraduate, which is you know, not, not a normal experience that undergraduates get to have. And then Charnel graduated from CSUMB, and she went on her merry way in her life. And then one day, I was presenting at the Whale Fest at, um, in 2018, and I gave a talk in this, as a seminar speaker at the Whale Fest, and after my talk, Charnel, who I hadn't seen, you know, in a couple years, came up to me and said, you know, I want to go to grad school. I want to like I need to I want to figure out what's next. I'm really interested like I've been working I've been doing this, you know, uh, she was working at Naval Postgraduate School running an outreach program, an education outreach program, and she wanted to think about what her next step was. And so she was, you know, super proactive about tr literally tracking me down that you know, she had found uh, you know, she had seen on a flyer that I was giving a talk at Whale Fest and she came to my talk and found me afterwards. And so we started a conversation about, you know, thinking about applying to grad school. And originally, when Charnel came to talk to me about uh, working in my lab and, and Corey's lab, because Charnel's co-advised by me and Corey, originally the plan had been that she was going to do a project on sea star wasting disease. Corey had a project he was really interested in, and you know I I was going to act as Charnel's main advisor, and I was like I I love sea stars. I work in the intertidal. That seems great. But then she took this trip to Catalina Island, and I wasn't on that trip. So I don't know what happened in Catalina Island, but much like sea star wasting disease, the plans of sea star wasting dissolved and instead were taken up by this new system that I knew nothing about pre Charnel working with me, rotolith beds. So she went away with Corey and with Di and was taken up by the thrill of rotolith beds and drones. And you know, for those of you who know me, I'm a marine ecologist. I don't typically work with drones or with rotolith beds, so this has been really fun for me to get to learn so much more about the ecology um, of rotolith beds and then also the amazing you know, capabilities of using drones to map submerged aquatic habitat. It's not surprising maybe that you know, uh, Charnel wound up working with drones and thinking about how we map habitats, given that as an undergraduate, you know, she worked on using ROVs she worked on using a technology to map habitats underwater, and so it makes sense that she was drawn to thinking about drones and mapping habitats above water. So after that you know, fateful trip to Catalina with Di and Corey, Charnel's you know, sea star wasting dreams dissolved just like a sea star, and instead birthed this you know, amazing project thinking about how we can use drones to accurately map underwater habitats in ways that can really improve our efficiency and our ability to find you know, where different habitats are. <coughs> so then, Charnel had a project, she had a plan, she applied for and was awarded the Wrigley Institute Graduate Fellowship. Everything was awesome. You know, she was gonna go to Wrigley, she was gonna be the graduate student in residence for the summer, get to be there, you know, work on the data and the process the data and things that she had already uh, acquired, get more seasonal data. This like, you know, this is a great fellowship that she applied for, it's competitive, she was awarded it. And then, as you guys all know, so she was awarded this fellowship in winter, in uh, fall of 2019, winter of 2020, to go to Catalina Island in summer 2020. Not surprisingly, as, as all of you guys know, um, then the coronavirus hit, the pandemic hit, and this just drastically changed her plans. And I think it's really important to note that, you know, I think Charnel was in 
the, the phase of grad school that was most impacted by COVID. She had finished her coursework, she was ready to start, you know, really focusing on her research, and her research required, required travel, it required bringing people together, it wasn't work. You know, if she, if she was still in the phase where she was taking classes, she could have, you know, knuckled down and focused on her classes. If she was in the phase where she had already collected her data, she could have knuckled down and processed the data and dealt with all of that. But she was in the phase where she was on the precipice of going out and collecting her data. And so this COVID disruption was really, you know, really a huge disruption for her with her thesis. So then, you know, everything went from being awesome to awful. And her Wrigley Graduate Fellowship went away plans for thinking about mapping seasonal changes in rotolith beds went away. But then, you know, the pandemic, we still became more manageable. Um, we learned to, you know, how we can wear masks and be around each other. And everything became kind of awesome. She did get to go to Wrigley again, or she did get to go to Wrigley the next, the next summer, you know, Wrigley honored the fellowship that she had earned. It didn't, it didn't look the same though, because there were lots of restrictions, so it still wasn't the amazing productive summer that she was going to have had it been pre-pandemic. But she got to go to Wrigley. She also applied for and was awarded one of the C-Superbs, the C-Superb Graduate Student Research, uh, Research Restart Program. So she applied for and got one of those competitive grants, which was great. And I wanna highlight one project that Charnel was involved in outside of her thesis, still very related to her thesis. But Charnel was featured in a, one of a series of books that highlights diverse scientists for, um, for kid books, for books targeting sort of middle school age. And so Charnel was a featured scientist in this STEAM Powered Careers book series called Marine Biology. And so you can see here, this is in the middle of the book. It's on a story um, about a little girl named Cora that explores marine systems. And in the middle of the book, Charnel, there's a Meet the Scientist feature and, you know, so there gives a little bit of information about Charnel. And then she essentially gives her thesis defense here. So, you know, she tells, she tells us how she does it, that, you know, part of her research project, she studies important ecosystems formed by rotoliths. Her goal is to learn about these ecosystems. She maps the location. You know, you really don't need to listen to her talk. You can just read this book written for middle schoolers and you'll be just fine. And so, you know, I think this is just a really a, a amazing project that she was part of. Um, I highly recommend checking out these books. There's one on data science, on oncology. There's all sorts of different science careers that are highlighted. I also want to highlight that, like many Marie, Ross Landing Marine Lab graduate students, Charnel worked during her graduate career. But Charnel worked a lot during her graduate career, and, you know, I think much more than many other students. She worked for the CMET program with um, all the programs in Corey Garza's lab. And she also worked full time for the last couple years of her graduate career it, with Lula's Chocolates. And while I very much appreciated the occasional chocolate gifts that I got, I, very, I also you know, really recognized how much this made it hard for Charnel to balance her academics with working so much. Um, and so I just want to call out, you know, how much time Charnel, how Charnel did all of this amazing work she's about to um, present to you while also maintaining a full-time job outside of Moss Landing. And as much as I might be sad that there won't be any chocolate treats anymore, I'm really excited that Charnel is moving on to her next step next week uh, to start as a Sea Grant Fellow with the Delta Stewardship Council. And I think this is going to be a, such a great fit for her to be a California Sea Grant Fellow with the Delta, Delta Stewardship Council because she's gonna get to use the GIS and other technology tools that she has acquired and shown how they can be used in marine environments and she's gonna get to apply those things in a science policy um, framework. So with that, I'm gonna introduce Charnel to take it away and give a much more detailed uh, look of her thesis than the uh, Marine Biology Steam Powered book does. Thank you, Allison. Um, wow. <laughs> and thank you for all of you for being here. Um, I will be presenting my thesis, which is on the effectiveness of aerial monitoring of spatial and temporal changes of Santa Catalina Island's rotolith beds. Um, I'm going to give a brief background, and then I'll go through three different questions. Each question's result will feed into the next question's um, start. 
And then I'll be discussing, um, doing the discussion and conclusion, and then finally, uh, future studies. So why do we study Earth habitat? Like, what's the importance of it? And then, um, well, one of the reasons is just looking how species interact with, this, with their habitat. Things like um, niche partitioning in um, certain areas where some species will be at one location of the tree while others will be at higher locations of the tree. Um, going into species abundance, we usually associate larger habitats with more species um, being available inside that habitat. Uh, things like human impact, how are we impacting our local habitats or even like more globally, how are we impacting um, habitats? And looking at things like loss and habitat recovery, how does that play a role in um, the species that are, are close to us as well as species that are far away from us? And then lastly, looking at climate change, like how does the overall change in our planet's climate affect habitats on a more local scale? So species vary related to their habitat, and we have tools that exist to measure variations. So in this image here, we can see that we, we want to study how um, the open space um, like interfaces with urban areas. We can definitely look at that and um, see how species interact with those in, um, between those different habitats. Uh, one other thing, too, is like a lot of our um, Ecological studies also happen in their intertidal, so how there's um, these partitioning and competition and things like that, and we can look at that um, habitat and monitor that habitat and see how species interact, both the, um, the animals as well as the vegetation within that area. And then going from terrestrial, we can also apply that to areas like uh, kelp forests, how species interact with the kelp forest, how healthy is the kelp forest, is it growing, is it recovering, are we losing that help, that um, kelp forest, and then how do the species interact with that, and how does that even affect us as humans if we're losing our kelp forests as well. As well? So one of the tools that we use to monitor habitats is uh, satellite data. Um, satellite data is great because we can monitor a huge area of habitat and get a lot of good data from that. Um, the, thing about satellite is that we don't really get a small resolution. Um, most satellite um, imagery is um, about a meter's resolution, which is still good, and we're still are able to capture a big area, um, but it's not as fine scale as we, can, as we may want it to be for something more local. Uh, so we have, like I said, we have satellites, and then on the other end of the scale, we have divers. So divers are great at looking at underneath and seeing how um, we can map the habitat underneath the water and how species interact with things like kelp forests um, and other um, megastrea, not, not that that isn't megastrea, but um, bull kelp forests and other laminaria um, and seagrasses and how um, those habitats are thriving and surviving or if we're losing some of those habitats due to um, predation or just um, ocean changes and things like that. So we have satellites. We have, on the other end, we have divers. But there is this gap in the middle here. And so um, with the merging technology that we have now, um, we can insert drones into that gap. Because drones can survey a large area um, with less time than a diver can, if we want to surround the whole perimeter of the bed, a drone can do that in a few minutes and with finer resolution than, say, a satellite does. Drones uh, resolution could be up to um, three centimeters. Like they could get a really, really fine um, resolution. So if we want to get more of what is going on in the habitat, maybe something um, like bulk help where the satellite may miss a few pieces of bulk kelp or an area of bulk kelp because of the resolution that's so big where a drone can actually pick that up. So in this video here, I'm going to show um, just some of the things that drones could do. This is at Cherry Cove on Catalina Island. And the drone is just going to go out and look for a habitat. So you can see. It's just going, 
And if you see a little bit of algae in the corner there, and as it keeps going, we're going to enter um, a more field. So we'll be able to see algae, um, the cinder blocks of the mooring, as well as the mid-chains of the mooring. And then when it gets to the habitat that it's looking for, it will then um, pan up and or zoom out and we'll be able to see the entirety of the habitat. the habitat there. Yeah. So the habitat that the drone um, was looking for were rotoliths. And rotoliths are uh, coralline calcifying algae that um, are individual in shape and spherical. They're unattached, and multiple individuals form a bed. Um, Rotoliths, because they're unattached, are subjected to currents underwater. So they are often um, phrased the tumbleweed of the sea. And they are globally distributed. Um, we can find them in all the different places around the world where there is uh, uh, visible, clear water. <laughs> And one thing that is really nice in, about rotoliths is that they're also um, a nursery ground and a foundation species for a lot of invertebrates. So here we have um, a crab that will forage around them. These a sea star can also be found in them. Um, snails and other um, nudibranchs could be found <laughs> around the beds. And then we have this little urchin here as well as a little megastria that will use it for nursery grounds. Um, it's so, with rotoliths, it's really important to understand them and, and figure out how they are being protected, if they are being protected, because they are essential nursery grounds for many different invertebrate species, as well as um, invertebrate species that feed into other um, fisheries of importance, like in Southern California and Catalina, we have the uh, spiny lobsters, and so invertebrates that feed into that um, fisheries use this habitat as nursery grounds. So around Catalina, there are several different beds. Um, the beds that I will be mapping and trying to understand more of are Emerald Bay at the top and Isthmus Cove kind of tucked away in that middle there. Um, but those are the known beds around Catalina. And one of the questions we have is like, have we found them all? Not just around Catalina, but just in um, this group of the world. If you look on the map here, um, this was a map from 2001 but there's not even a pinpoint where Catalina is. Catalina's um, brutalist studies have just recently started in maybe the last 20, 10, 20 years or so. So the question is, have we found them all, and um, how can drones uh, help find them? So I'm going to go through the three different questions that I'll be asking. One is, can drones detect brutalists? Um, can they map them? The other is what are the optimal settings for surveying rural beds in Catalina. And the third is how does drone generated data compare with diver generated data? So the first question right here. Okay, so for uh, to start out, we just went out to see if we can even see them, if we can even map rural lists. Um, so I flew the drone um, in a long shape pattern uh, over the area that I was hoping to find and map rural lists. The drone was, um, PIX4D was the software that we used to pilot the drone, as well as the software we used to stitch their ortho mosaic. So an ortho mosaic is just a, a geo-reference image of the habitat, or the, it's a map that's generated by uh, drone pictures. So as the drone is flying, it's gonna take geo-reference pictures, and as, when it's done, it'll, the software will stitch all those pictures together to give me a large, ortho mosaic of the habitat that I'm surveying. So we were just going out and looking, and it's 
can we, can we map row them? Can we see them in a map? And the answer was kind of. So um, here, is this going to work? Maybe? Okay. So we, we can see some here, and we can see some here. Here we have, um, which is yes, but there's a lot of sun glint, there's a lot of wave action here. So then it's like, okay, so let's try it again. What about if we went out and tried to map the beds again? So we went out and we got a better map, um, but here it's not getting the full Royalist map. So we have them here, but it's not quite, not quite there yet. So then that leads into the, the yes, we can see them, we can um, map them, but how can we do it better? What are the optimal settings for serving Rolith beds on Catalina? So with that, um, I went out and flew again, but this time varying the height from 60 meters, 80 meters to 100 meters, um, varying the overlap and image. So like I said, the, the drone is taking image and we can say in the software how much overlap we want in the next image or for all the images. So I um, set it for 85, 90, and 95. And then varying the camera angle, most of the flights that we're taking, we're taking at 90 degree camera angle, which is the camera pointing straight down. The only time we tried to do a slightly off camera angle was when we had like a really, when we went out during midday and there's a lot of sun glit. So we were trying to see if we can mitigate the sun glit just a little bit, just by off tilting the camera. Um, one thing I do wanna uh, make sure I say is that every flight was done with a polarized lens to help also try to mitigate um, some of that glare and hopefully um, allow us to see the drone to detect rollers better. And then the other time we tried was just morning and afternoon um, to see how fair that works. And um, on the island, morning is usually best because that's usually also when the, not only is the wind uh, slower, <laughs> there's not a lot of wind in the morning, but it's also um, less sunglit when you go earlier out in the day. So height, overlap, camera angle, and time of day. So again, with mapping, um, this is what we uh, got. Um, this image here was with a 65. That was the very high um, sunglit day. There was also quite a bit of wind that day. Uh, this one here was, um, we were at 60 meters with about a 70, 80% uh, overlap. And so we weren't able to get even a lot of the bed, even in this picture, it was just only, this was the only thing that we could get, but also you can see here in the image, there was also still a lot of sun glint um, and everything else, so it would make stitching the pictures um, difficult. Uh, and those, both those locations are at Emerald, Emerald Bay, and then this one was at Isthmus, whoop, whoa, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so this one was at Isthmus, um, and this one was flown lower. This was at 60 meters, again, 70% or 80% uh, overlap, and it just wasn't able to capture the fullness of the bed. So after going through and flying at all the various different, different um, uh, variations that we can fly the drone, we, came, we were able to get the full bed um, in this image here. And here, you can see the rollers here here, here, and this whole area right here is the extent of the rollless bed. And the optimal settings for that was, um, I have 90 meters here, it's actually 80 meters height, 90 per, uh, degree camera angle, 95% image overlap, and in the morning, again, to mitigate the sun and um, wind stress that could be out there. So question two, how does drone generate, or sorry, question three, <laughs> how does drone generated data compare to diver generated data? So the three parameters that I'm going to be comparing are the rototh bed perimeter area and live cover at Isthmus Cove and Emerald Bay during January 2020 and September 2021. Um, so again, just to reiterate the drone collection, um, I'm flying the drone at 80 meters um, in a lawnmower fashion over the rotolith beds here, which is indicated in orange. Uh, this bed here is Emerald Bay 2020, 
And uh, the height is 80 meters, the camera angle is 90, um, overlap is 95. And so what the drone is collecting here, we're looking at again, the area, perimeter, and life cover um, is what uh, this will give us. And then the diver side of um, this method is the divers here, um, which are divers in the water here. These are the diver bubbles. Um, this is a buoy line or the buoy on the surface. So the divers are going to drive around the perimeter of the rotolith bed, giving a tug for the boat crew um, where to take the GPS, um, sig uh, GPS point. So they swim around the entirety of the bed, get collecting GPS points that it will then put into ArcMap to compare both the diver perimeter um, and area. And then the divers will go into the rotolith bed, sorry, and take um, percent cover. So the way they do that, there's tw they do three, two to three transects along 20 meters, and they take five quadrat photos of the rotolith, the substrate down there. So this is a picture of one of the quadrats, and this would be considered 100% cover in that quadrat. So they do an estimate percent cover for that transect, and then they do a collective, we'll do a collective percent cover for all the three to four transects. And while they're down there, sometimes some of the locals like to come and help out with the surveying. So just to go over the data analysis process, um, again, this is the drone image, and what I would do in ARC is just without any uh, diver data points, I would go through and create a shape file around the rotolith bed as seen here. And then I would add in the data, um, the diver data, and do connect the dots of the perimeter in, um, from the diver data. And then here, I would overlay both those shape files just so I can see how well they overlay. The green is um, where the both the perimeter and area overlap, where the yellow and blue um, indicate the diver and drone, and I'll go into that more in a little bit. And then um, how I did the percent cover from drone is slightly different. It's going to be different from what the divers do. So like I said, the divers are underwater taking these transects and um, presenting their life cover that way, where with the drone, I'm actually doing the percent cover over the entirety of the bed. So this is the image classification. This is um, me doing some uh, software training to say, hey, this is what is rotolith, this is sand, and this is mooring or other algae. And so then the um, computer, the arc map will then generate a classified image, like this one here, parsing out what is rotolith, uh, what is sand, mooring, boats, um, and other algae. Uh, so from there, once I do all these steps, I do a percent difference between the perimeter um, and area, which is basically taking the diver um, number, which is the standard number. We're using that as a standard number in this case, minusing out the, um, subtracting the drone uh, perimeter number, and then dividing that by the diver to get a percent difference between um, the two methods. And then I also will plot um, the um, perimeter area and live percent cover on a linear model to see how well they relate to each other. So on to the results of that. Um, so here is again the um, overlaying of the different shape files. This is Emerald Bay 2020 and Ember Bay 2021, the image that we've seen earlier. Um, and again, uh, the green is overlaying, is the part that is um, both, that both the drone and the diver um, agree on. And then the blue is just drone and the yellow is just diver. Um, and then here, are the numbers generated from that information. So we have the diver um, perimeter and area, the drone perimeter area, and then here down the bottom is the percent difference. 
Um, and the drone typically gave larger estimates um, than diver for both perimeter and area. And I did this for all, for both sites and both time frames of generating those two, um, generating the perimeter area and the percent difference. And so this is what um, the perimeter looks like um, in the linear model. There is a strong relationship um, between the drone and diver data, um, with drone generally estimating larger than perimeter. Um, we see where they converge here as well. Um, and we have a really strong, like really strong R squared as well. And then here, looking at area, again, we have a strong relationship between the two methods. Um, with a really strong uh, R square value. Um, again, drones generally estimating larger areas than divers. So here I'm gonna just uh, recap a little bit on the um, live percent cover. So the divers are much on a much small, smaller scale collecting the live percent cover where drones is taking the life percent cover of the full bed. So when we do the um, linear model, when we, map, when we graph it, um, it doesn't show closely related at all. They don't really have show a strong correlation. And that makes sense because of this, it, it's mostly due to the scale of which the live uh, roll of cover is being collected. Um, again, the, the drone is taking the entirety of the bed where the divers is just taking three or four transects underneath the water. So the scale at which they are measuring the live rotolith cover um, is different. So it would make sense as to why we wouldn't have such a strong correlation here. In summary, so can drones detect rotolith beds? Yes, they can. Um, what are the optimal settings for Catalina? We have 80 meters high, 95% overlap, 90 degree camera angle, and preferably in the morning, but you know, sometimes you have to delay till the next morning. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, question three, are, are they, how well do they compare to diver data? Drones are closely related to diver data in perimeter area, but not so closely related when it comes to um, the way divers and uh, drones collect um, live cover, which makes sense. So for the discussions, um, drones are compatible for mapping uh, submerged habitats and efficient in collecting data in marine, for marine science. Um, it is, like I said, an emerging tool and is starting to be used widely in marine science. Um, and one of the, the advantages for drone is that you can map an area um, like the Emerald Bay 2020 in seven to nine minutes versus an hour with the divers trying to get perimeter of the bed. Um, the measurements for the drones tend to be larger, but that could be just due to visibility or um, just not as precise. Like I said, when I go through in the arc, I, um, an arc map to make the drone shape file, it's not gonna be this, as precise as the dot to dot connection of the GPS points. So that could be a reason why um, the memories are a little bit higher. Um, it's also due to error of just making sure the full bed is in that shape file when um, mapping with the drone so you don't miss any of the habitat that you're surveying. One thing that we did find for um, mapping the drone is that in Emerald Bay, both time periods, that they were able to actually pick up more habitat um, than what the diver was able to um, take up. So this pink um, shapefile here is the diver. The blue that is more transparent is what the drone is saying is rotolith bed, which is really cool because then it just means that, okay, well, let's go out and make sure, <laughs> let's go and um, survey that um, habitat even more. And this could be in addition to what the um, already established rotolith bed is. It just, it's not that they, um, didn't see or whatever, it's just that we weren't able to get out there in, in the time span. Um, so in conclusions, um, drones are efficient 
um, they're cost repetitive, they take less time to map um, habitats and rural sites. Um, they also have a higher resolution than satellites. Um, optical drone settings for uh, Catalina would be different for depending on where you are habitat, um, mapping a habitat. Like in the um, earlier image, a satellite, they use, they are mapping um, bull kelp up there, but there's also people who were mapping bull kelp up in Sonoma County where their settings for mapping canopy um, habitat was different from mine. They use a 70 um, percent overlay in images and they were flying at a much higher 120 meters um, to map that habitat. But again, it depends on where you are and what you're looking for, whether it's on the surface or on below the water, is to determine what would be the best setting for the habitat you're trying to map. Um, for future studies, we can look at, we can use drone for ecosystem studies, surveying damage. Uh, on Catalina, like I said, the, I don't know if I said it or not, but the majority of the rolla feds are in mooring fields. So they are susceptible to things like mooring scars and damage from the mooring change. So this study, a future study that drones could use is to map out those mooring scars and um, see how much if or little it takes away from the actual entirety of the habitat. Uh, long-term monitoring, integrating drones and divers for long-term monitoring, um, looking at seasonal changes, if the bed shifts a lot for seasonal changes, uh, looking to see if the beds even shift more weekly. So you don't necessarily want to send out a diver every week to monitor the perimeter, but you can send a drone out to collect that data. And then also pair um, data with diver to look at things of um, species, inter um, uh, species abundance and, and things like that um, when comparing both drone and diver data for long-term monitoring. Um, and discovery, like the Emerald Bay photo, where there's a appears to be a lot more role of habitat there than what the divers are able to collect, and going back to the global distribution, like discovering more role effects or even more other habitats that we haven't found yet. Okay, so I just want to say thank you to everyone for listening to my thesis presentation. Thank you to everyone online. Um, thank you to C Grant and CCME for um, funding as well as C Superb. Um, thank you to everyone at USC Wrigley um, for the fellowship offer as well as just your support, Kelly and everyone out there. Um, thank you, mom and dad and uh, my sisters for your support, all friends and everyone watching online. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to my committee, Allison and Corey. Corey, thank you for trusting me with the drones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, with, with that, that I, will I will take, take any, any questions. questions. Divers to ground crew. Well, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, um, the where we list were and everything else like that. And so um, the specifics within the beds, I, I was not able to detect, but I was able to say, okay, this like in the darker green was another algae, and the bare sand was bare sand. So you were colorism, basically. Um, not when I was classifying. Yeah, it was, it was in the bed. It was. I just classified it as well as yeah. Cool. Next question is, um, in some places there's a really clear, distinct line between the dark patch and the lighter sand, and it's easy to find where the edge is. In other places it seems to kind of gradually fade, uh, and in those kind of gradient areas, how do you decide where to draw the line between what's in the bed versus not in the bed? That plays into the, um, 
maybe over um, the uh, airing on the side of caution to say like when mapping with the drone um, to say like this is part of the bed. But again, I, I relied a lot on the divers to say what is and isn't as far as the bed is concerned. Deeper, it's harder than harder to see the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's not an issue because maybe the road is only shallow where they get good light. But, mm -hmm. but if they do go into some of those deeper regions, how do you deal with the change in visibility with depth? So, um, Catalina waters are pretty clear. And Isthmus Bed, the deepest part was uh, 40 feet. But we were still able, the drone was still able to pick that. That up, and that was also correlated where the divers also turned around and said that this is the edge of the bed. Okay. So, yeah, so um, in other places that would probably be a problem. <laughs> um, I know in a, in a paper that was looking at eelgrass, um, they had a hard time having the drone detect the differentiation in eelgrass at like three to four meters. So, it does just depend on, on where you are. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, when we did fly, they did mention you know, we did try to go for lower tides just to um, eliminate that, uh, to mitigate wa the water over the littlest. Um, it is better to try to survey at low tides, but again, when you're kind of time constrained, it's also when's the best window to fly as well. Um, so we didn't didn't have too much issue with the tide, but we still try to aim for a low tide. I'm curious whether you measured or tried to calculate the change in the sort of the size of the beds between those two time periods and whether the, the diver or the drone indicated their, the beds were more stable or the change more. Um, I didn't with this one, but had I done the seasonal one, I definitely would have um, looked more into like the, the structure of them and if they had changed a lot during, during the time period. There's um, better for me to escape or not. Um, looking at the Isthmus one, while we were out there for 2021, um, I noticed, like, Dyer was mentioning how it does seem a little bit closer to the rocks than this one is. Um, so it could have shifted during that time period, but I didn't, I didn't measure for a shift in that. I don't know if that answers your question. You could, though, I guess, right? You know, since you have those two time points. Yeah, yeah. yeah. from the Zoom. First from, Jessica. First from Jessica Franks. Great defense. You say that drones take less time to get more coverage, but how does that compare to the time it takes to analyze the drone footage? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, sometimes stitching the ortho mosaic can take a while. Uh, so usually like it takes a few minutes, like I said, seven to nine minutes to map the bed. And then once you open upload in the software, you can basically walk away, go have lunch, is basically what happens. And then um, um, depending on how many photos you have and how large the area is, it could take an hour, it could take a couple of hours and um, just to get the ortho mosaic. Once it's in Arc uh, Map, if you're familiar with Arc Map or Arc Pro, it actually, that process does take, that process is a little quicker if you're familiar with the steps that you need to do. Plus in um, Arc, Pro and Art Map, you can um, set it up to where things just automatically run on its own. You could create a tool that will run through all the processes that will um, that you'll need to do. Yeah. Okay. We also have some questions from Nicole Barber. Um, first, is there a potential to do longer time series modeling with drones? E.g., could you easily send out drones to monitor every day for a year or more to capture seasonal changes? Um, every day would be hard just because the limitation would be weather at that point, as well as tide. Um, but yes, that's the that was um, one of the points in a future study of like you can send it out weekly or monthly or even um, if you wanted to do a daily thing where the weather is permittable. Then yeah, you can definitely do that. All right, next, um, Kelly Hoffman. Hi, Kelly. Um, I'm 
can you capture population density with these images rather than just percent area coverage? My initial thought was to say yes, but I'm trying to remember population density. <laughs> Sorry. Um, other than percent coverage, so yes, because the, the way that I took percent coverage was just taking the area of rotolith and divide it by the total area of the um, bed itself, which gave me the percent cover. So if you're looking at population density, you should be able to map that. Um, I would imagine underwater that would be difficult, but I know like terrestrial you could absolutely do that too. And that last question from Nicole. Are these drones really impacted by weather such as can you not go out in storms or high wind days? If so, what's the threshold? Um, so drones have a max um, speed of 25, um, I think it's miles, miles per hour. Uh, sorry, I had to. Uh, so, so yes, because you don't. Uh, high winds would make your drone fly higher if it fly faster if it could fly at all. Also, um, if you're submerging something that is underwater, sur surveying something that's submerged, um, that storm is going to definitely m m uh, not make a good surface for you to map underneath water with. Um, so if you, for mapping in general, even if it's like mapping during, on the terrestrial land, right. storms can definitely interfere greatly with your, with your um, image collection. Um, there's one more person question in the chat, but first name, one person question. Um, so you know this difference in the scale um, that the divers are looking at with percent cover versus the drones. Um, do you think there's a way to design the dive survey so that you keep around your thing at the same scale that the drones is? Yeah, so, um, so one way to do that is um, having the GPS points of where the divers take the survey and a heading and then doing a, to, to match scale with an arc um, instead of doing the full life cover of the bed, I would just use the, the diver's transect information and doing transects within ARC for the diver, if that answers your question. I'm not seeing any personal questions. Robert, from Kelly, do you have First, what is the resolution GSD at 80 meter altitude for the drone you use? Um, the drone resolution that I have, um, the drones, the resolution is usually like centimeters in difference. At 80 meters, um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> um, I didn't look that deep into uh, uh, that for that. Then next, um, why did you use a hand-drawn polygon rather than a polygon from your classification? To run a classification, they needed to um, to be specific with the polygons because there are there's a lot of information outside of the um, bed itself that could interfere with actual classification. So when I did the classification, I wanted to make sure it was just classified within that area. Um, and because I'm also only classifying four different things, I don't want the classification to take that out to the full um, image because there's so much more going on outside of the actual bed itself. All right, and last one from Pat. Um, did you get the backing DSM, I assume that's the bit of tree, as well as an orphan mosaic from X40? Not the symmetry. Yeah. The ortho mosaic for the surface part. The symmetry would I would need something else to a different tool to map underneath the water. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you so much.